So we have one more talk before our lunch break. And that will be a talk from David Sporar. I did see David in the big blue button a little earlier. He turned on his camera. So uh, that was that was really cool seeing, seeing David. Um, David has been around in the community since a lot, a lot, for a lot of years. Um, he wrote to me that he's been using Flow when it was still called Flow 3, for those of you who, who remember the times. And it wasn't even released as a 1.0 version yet. And David has made a living out of that. Uh, he created Pass Creator. Um, and that's the case study he's going to talk about today. Uh, David lives in Munich with his fiance and his dog, and which I find really cool he volunteers at the twh uh, so a relief uh, organization here in uh, germany and so that's another you know uh, opportunity to to provide support um, going along the lines of what laura talked about earlier so um, enjoy david's case study of pass creator which is a really really cool flow application Welcome to my case study about Pass Creator. My name is David. I'm co-founder and CEO of Pass Creator. I'm a software developer. I'm 30 years old and live and work in Munich, Germany. Pass Creator is a SaaS solution to create, manage, and distribute wallet passes. We founded it initially in 2012. It's based on Flow primarily and it's developed by a company called Media Helden here in Munich. Pass Creator is running a freemium model, which means you can sign up for free, create a couple of passes, try out all the features we have, and uh, if you need more passes, you need to enroll in a paid plan. Right now, we have registrations from roughly 130 countries, and we have paying customers from currently 42 different countries. The application serves customers basically of all sizes that ranges from a small bakery around the corner up to Fortune 500 companies with subsidiaries all around the world. Since its launch, Pass Creator has issued around 50 million passes. Some numbers from today. Right now, there are roughly 6,000 different campaigns in the system. There are four and a half thousand flow accounts, which means different logins. There's roughly a thousand API integrations from customers. And we estimate that we create roughly around 30 million passes in 2020. That number has gotten some hit due to the COVID-19 situation, but we've seen quite some recovery in stats during the last couple of weeks. Our core SaaS solution is publicly available, but we do run dedicated systems for a couple of customers and also some on-premise systems. In terms of customers, we do serve five out of the 20 largest insurance companies, four out of the 10 largest car manufacturers. And right now there are roughly around 30 different white label customers who resell Pass Creator as their own solution. So they are running it under their own subdomain. They get their own theme for the back end. So end customers won't even notice that it's Pass Creator, but at its core, it's still our SaaS solution. Since we're a small team, I wanted to talk about how we work. We do not implement customer specific features. That allows us to focus on what's most important for us, which is primarily wallet passes and all of its variations. We do run regular load tests that amounts to one and a half to two months each year to just make sure that the system really is built for scale. And we rely on strong partners, namely that is primarily Flow Native, Google Cloud, and our partner program, which allows agencies to resell the solution. This enables us to not need to 
employ people who for example run our infrastructure and really focus on on the software side of things and last but not least there's automation we have tests for everything in the system we have obviously ci cd pipelines which is pretty common in modern software systems but one example for the on-premise and dedicated systems if we cannot automate things we don't do it otherwise the work involved would just be too much for us that's not our business if there are requirements that are not part of the core and we are not willing to build these features into the core of pass creator we are building small middlewares that are in itself flow applications that talk to the pass creator api to create and modify things like wallet passes or templates or um, use webhooks to fetch data from the system. This allows us to, for example, build custom dashboards with different data than what's what's available in the right in Pass Creator. That can be done by customers themselves also, obviously, but we do that sometimes for customers as well. The core of the application is developed completely in-house by ourselves. And if we need native apps, for example, we have an app called Pass Creator Companion, which is used by merchants to scan and validate wallet passes on site. We do that externally. A couple of customer projects. Mercedes-Benz Consulting is using Pass Creator to issue tickets for events they are doing. Mercedes-Benz Consulting is a wholly owned subsidiary of Daimler which is uh, the corporate above Mercedes-Benz. When they issue tickets, they either set up a publicly available landing page where you can sign up. These landing pages are part of Pass Creator, or they send passes via email to attendees in case the event is an invite-only event. For on-site validation, they are using the companion app that I just mentioned. And they are using push notifications to inform their visitors during the event. For example, Pass Creator allows you to schedule certain messages that will be pushed to the wallet passes. And if you have an, a conference or an event where certain tar talks start at different times, you can schedule the application to send push notifications 10 minutes before the actual talk starts, thus informing your visitors and customers. Another customer is Lagardère, which is a sports marketing company operating in different countries. And they used Pass Creator to issue tickets for the RB Leipzig Pokalnacht, which is a party that happened after the final of German DFB Pokal, which is a soccer tournament for the best soccer clubs in Germany. And after the game ended, they started a party, which was for players, for family of players, and guests also. They also use push notifications to inform visitors, and they are also using our companion app to validate passes. Primus Line is a shipping company from Frankfurt in Germany. You might notice that that layout from the wallet pass looks similar to a boarding pass that you will know from airlines most likely. It's the same concept. In this case, it's just used to onboard a ship. They have built an integration with their e-commerce store, which works in a way that if you order a ticket for their ships, they automatically create a wallet pass version of the ticket and offer that to you right after the checkout. And in addition, they also send the ticket to you via email, the, the download link basically. On site, in that case, on the ship, there's again an employee using our companion app to scan passes and to validate if the ticket that you're showing is valid. In addition, they also have print versions, which, which is working as well. But I'm not going to mention that in detail because it's just not our core business. Another project that is quite interesting in terms of integration with Pass Creator is Smarter Visit which is a project that we've built on our own together with an agency from Stuttgart, which is called Netzwerk P. Smarter Visit is a visitor management solution, a smart queuing solution. And during sign up, the software will ask you for the data from your store. For example, 
the days your store is open, the opening hours, how many people are allowed in your store at the same time, and the average time they will stay in your store. That gives us a way of offering a calendar where you can choose a time slot and book an appointment for the store. Thus, an efficient way to manage the number of people on site. The speciality is Smarter Visit is using Pass Creator as a data store, basically, and also relies on the Pass Creator's capabilities in terms of GDPR compliance. For example, if you book an appointment for a certain date, we automatically remove the pass a couple of days after that to ensure that the personal data is only stored in the system as long as it's needed. Around that, around the integration, there's still a custom UI, a custom sign-up process, a different pricing model. Basically, it's Pass Creator with a different user interface for one special use case. We have a couple of these projects done by customers as well, but this is one we did our, on our own, so I can show you more about it. This is the calendar. That's what you've already seen. So if you click on a day, the system automatically shows you how many slots are available. And if you click on book appointment for a specific slot, you just get a regular sign up form, enter your data, click on book now. That will in turn in the background trigger the pass creator API to create the wallet pass and then deliver that wallet pass through an integration right on that page. That screenshot is from an iPhone. If you're using an Android device, you'll get a different button because Apple Wallet is not available on iPhones, uh, on Android phones. So we'll just show an app that works on Android. That's what the wallet pass looks like. So everything is in the design of the customer. We automatically fetch the color from the logo you upload, but obviously you can customize it afterwards. So you really get a tailor-made solution for your store. When the customer arrives on site, there's again a scanning app that is residing in the phone's browser, and you can use that to scan the ticket, the wallet pass on a user's phone. In that case, if there's an appointment for one person, we automatically increase the visitor count for one. If there's an appointment for three persons, we add three persons to the people on site. That system works throughout various entry and exit points, which means if you have multiple entry and exit points um, and five people are leaving, you decrease the visitor count by five and the people at the entry point at the door will know that they can now let in five more people. That's the use cases. Now, how we do it, there's a couple of different things I want to talk about. First of all, the general concept, the architecture behind Pass Creator. I mentioned Flow Native already. We're using Google Cloud and the product Flow Native Beach, which is the, the hosting, the managed hosting for Kubernetes on Google Cloud that Flow Native is offering. And we're using that for quite some years now, and it's really working well. On Flow Native Beach, there's a couple of services that we use and run. For one, it's Google Pubs Up. That's not exclusively from Flow Native, but uh, we're using it as a job queue to process asynchronous tasks. There's Redis for caching, which is used in nearly every part of the system. Elasticsearch to make queries efficient and fast. Cloud SQL as our database backend and roughly around 15 custom integrations. And these integrations are still part of our core system. For example, APNS is the push notification service from Apple. And we need that to be working reliably and the integration to be reliably in order to deliver push notifications to end users' phones. Same thing for Google Pay. And also there's quite some integrations to payment service gateways and to payment providers. Now. On top of that, there's different services that are flow applications. There's a worker service taking care of long running processes in the background or things that are taking too long to do them asynchronously, or for example, like updating statistics and uh, refreshing the search index. 
Then there's a service for front end and API, which is basically the customer facing part of the application. And there's a scheduling and billing service. Scheduling is basically like cron jobs and billing is everything that has to do with creating and issuing invoices, sending them to customers and fetching data from customers' credit cards or by SEPA debit, for example. The cool thing about this architecture is everything can be scaled independently of each other. For example, if a customer uploads a CSV file consisting of 300,000 lines, which means he wants to create 300,000 wallet passes, we can just scale up the worker service and make that process faster automatically. If there's a peak in requests to the front end or API, we can just scale that without um, losing resources or adding resources to the worker that are not needed. So it's really a cost efficient way of running the whole thing. And it served us pretty well so far. The second thing I want to talk about is localization. Wallet passes, as you can see on the right, it's the exact same wallet passes displayed on different phones with different operating system languages. And wallet will automatically display the pass in the, in the language of your phone, which means if you're using the phone in French, you'll see a French pass. If you're using a German phone, you'll see a German pass and so on. Wallet passes can be translated into 40 different languages. And these translations are completely generic. So we can't just add XLIF files to do the job. We need to have an interface that allows customers to enter these translations. That is true both for wallet passes themselves as well as for the download pages that Flow serves or the Flow application we've built. Also, it's possible to only localize certain parts of a pass. For the other labels, the system will automatically fall back to the default language and the default language is generic as well. That means most likely it's English, but it doesn't have to be. The system will take any default language you choose. And delivery should be fast and efficient, obviously. So how we do that? Basically, as soon as you edit a pass in the back end and save that, we'll automatically calculate every value that will be used on a pass and save that in a Redis cache. There's one cache entry for each pass template if the cache is uh, expired, we'll automatically check if the entry is there or and regenerate it on the first try. The cache ID is the UUID of the pass template, which allows us to make sure that, for example, if a worker wants to update a cache entry, he can do that just by searching for the UUID and refreshing the cache entry, and that will immediately be available to the front-end services, for example. This means all services share one cache, making that system really efficient and fast at the same time. And so far, we haven't had errors regarding that process. And it's fast. It's really fast. Another thing we've built on top of Flow is a very ex exhaustive roles and permission system. Basically, our system works in a way on sign up you get all permissions. You can use every part of the system. But since we do want to serve enterprise customers, we need to have a way or offer them a way to create custom roles. So every customer can create his own set of permissions, which result in a role. Pass Creator includes 60 different permissions to choose from. I'm going to talk about how we do that in more detail in just a second. But in the end, these permissions are method privileges. On the right side, you see an example for such a role. You can combine permissions to functionality, for example, create passes or few existing passes. And you can also limit what objects a user will see, for example, campaign A and B. This is working very well in large corporate environments where you have a headquarter maintaining certain parts of a campaign, but each subsidiary in each country where the company operates needs to be able to do certain amendments to these templates that are relevant to them. So the headquarter has access to all the templates and each subsidiary has only access to the templates that are relevant to them. What's working as well is we can create roles 
that gives accounting people only access to billing settings, invoices, stuff like that. This is a system that it's around for a year now, roughly, and it's working very well. And it's so far, we haven't had problems with performance either. From a technical point of view, everything is built upon flow policies. And I'm talking about the flow uh, flows policy YAML files. We're using method privileges and entity privileges. Each permission set is a method privilege in the end. And entity privileges are using a custom security context that I'm talking about in a second as well. So when you create a custom role, you select from method privileges that are predefined, and you select the objects that a user should have access to. And that will be stored in the database, which means there's a role that is assigned to a customer and that has various method privileges and object IDs assigned to it. Now, obviously, again, we don't want to query the database for every request, so we store that in a cache. And that caching system, that the cache is shared among instances and services, is very important in that case as well. Because if the worker service creates an object, it should be visible to the user that is using the front-end service as well, obviously. So that's what we do there. As soon as a new object is created, like a new template, the cache is updated automatically and making sure that objects are visible to users immediately. How these roles are applied then? For one, there's a role aspect. That aspect kicks in when Flow creates privilege target objects. This means if a user, which is in technical terms an account in Flow, has assigned a custom role object, he only has a base role assigned, a base flow role that is predefined, but all other method privileges are granted dynamically on login by just looking at the role object that is stored in the Redis cache, and then the role aspect grants every method privilege automatically and dynamically that is assigned to the custom roles. For objects, basically, we have a custom security context that is also cached and that is storing the assigned object IDs, which are the UU IDs that are assigned to a certain role. Roles are combined, which means if a user has 10 different roles, he get all permissions that are defined by these roles. And the rest is basically the standard entity privilege of flow, which means we're just checking if a user has access to certain IDs and then show them. And this is how we are able to handle both enterprise customers and small customers. I'm pretty excited about this. Thanks for listening. And on a final note, I'm referring to some discuss discussions going on on Twitter today when I'm recording the talk. Here's my dog. Just wanted to mention that. Thanks for listening. Take care. Stay healthy. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, David, for this great talk. And thank you for sharing your dog. That, <laughs> that especially part of the dog uh, of the talk. <laughs> More as, dog content. As you can hear, we already have David on the line. Um, before we jump into the discussion with him, uh, I just wanted to say thank you to Victor Isaac, uh, who gave us a hint uh, regarding our sound issue. So thank you very much for that. Um, we hope the audio quality is much better now and we don't have the artifacts uh, anymore. So, um, David, there you are. Hi, great to see you. Hi. People are Good so quick in too. changing their shirts. Um, and their headphones. It's it's amazing. <laughs> so, uh, thank you very much for uh, this uh, awesome introduction to Pass Creator. Um, it's a, it sounded like a really big flow application. Um, it is in the meantime. I mean, it, it grew into that. We've started uh, quite quite a long time ago, actually basically back in 2012, as I mentioned, and it, in the beginning it was just a, a pet project and um, grew into a serious business in, throughout the years, basically. So your code has probably seen Flow major version upgrades. Yeah. 
a lot <laughs> and uh, we've also iterated a lot because back in 2012 uh, my knowledge when i was uh, doing all that completely alone was uh, a lot different from from today so um, there's a lot of refactoring on a daily basis basically what what was your experience uh, upgrading flow versions um, how do you approach that today um, i mean as i mentioned on the on the talk already we're doing a lot of tests so mostly that is uh, going from from unit tests to acceptance tests that is uh, checking if the if the ui and the feature set is working so we're just um yeah trying to run the migrations and see if if stuff breaks and then fix things again um from our experience it's uh, most updates went really smooth so there's uh A big big compliment to the to the Neos core team already on uh, yeah I think it's great and it's it's still the reason why we love it um, to use it which version of flow is pass creator running on at the moment right now it's uh, 5.3 so the LTS version wow that's cool right um, in our discussion um, You and Maya already talked about caching. Caching seems yeah. to be... I, I, I've heard the developers in our team speak about, you know, the hard things in software development. and It's my eternally least favorite thing in the world. <laughs> you, you yes, I feel you. <laughs> Thank but you. But still, it's needed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah. So you, you told us about um, this this one time where you had uh, a nasty caching issue in the front end, which affected users. Yeah, I mean, basically, it's a, a concurrency is always always an issue from the experience we have with caching. Sometimes, especially with the use case that I mentioned regarding uh, roles and permissions, for example, you can when you upload a CSV file to Pass Creator, we create a job, and uh, which jobs you have permissions to is cached. Um, and it's usually not a problem if the front-end service um, that you're accessing when you're using the API or the user interface um, is, is adding new objects. But when that is done in the background by a worker service, um, there has to be a way of adding that new object to the cache, to the list of IDs you're allowed to access. And we had a pretty nasty bug where the worker service was adding objects and then uh, sending out an email to customers telling them, yeah, we're done click on that link to see the results and then all they got was a was a not found exception which is not the experience you want for users and so that's the reason why we're now sharing a, a common redis cache for these purposes with um, all services basically so we can just refresh parts of the cache that are used uh, from the worker service that will then take effect in the front end as well That sounds like, you know, you, you've put a lot of thought into the architecture of, of this application. Um, what were your biggest challenges if you look back over the years um, when you developed Path Creator? Um, I mean, to be really honest, since <laughs> I, it started as a pet project, learning flow was the biggest challenge <laughs> in the beginning. Um, but obviously, there's uh, in the, when the years go by, there's a couple of other things. I mean, the most most not as, uh, or most importantly, in the last two years was most likely security, um, since I mentioned uh, insurance companies, and uh, we also have some some banks on our customer list, so they uh, take that very seriously. We do that as well. And um, the other thing is scalability and really um, improving the performance, especially given that the project is quite a couple of years old now. So it's not that easy sometimes to just throw out parts and while maintaining the functionality. And so that's the reason why we're doing quite often load tests. And also uh, Blackfire is one of my favorite tools to just do uh, in-depth performance profiling and finding Yeah, where the application lacks performance or loses time sometimes. So if someone really wants to know something about flow performance testing, you do have some experience you could share. <laughs> yes, you cannot ask me about that. 
David, um, I already asked Christian earlier, and I'll ask you too. How was this experience, the recording yourself at home to be viewed remotely later by people? Um, it's interesting. It's different. Um, but I, I think it's it's quite cool. I mean, when we when we're finished, I just go to the kitchen, and make myself some food. So <laughs> that's <laughs> definitely different from regular conferences. No, I mean it's it's just different, and I think it's great that we have the technology to do it that way and uh, not having to skip all these things due to the to the hard times we're uh, experiencing. So I think it's a great great thing. It's a bit different, but. Um, I think we'll get used to it. You mentioned some technical difficulties. Well, not technical, some sound difficulties. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and basically uh, I was uh, had a bit time pressure because of the, the new project we're doing and then I finished recording my talk on Friday. And actually I did that two times and uh, during the last couple of minutes the neighbors started to using a drill hammer uh, so I could just throw away the recordings, uh, the two first attempts of the recording. Then I just uh, went out with the dog, uh, took a bottle of beer with me, and afterwards it worked. And that was the result that you saw earlier. <laughs> so the conference can thank a beer and your dog for your talk. Yes, <laughs> yes, especially my dog. He's uh, the most important part of the talk. And given the discussions on Twitter, if cats or dogs have been better, I was actually thinking about if I throw out the past creator part of the talk and just talk about the dog. I um, would have but loved I that decided talk. against it. Yes, uh, I, maybe we should uh, set up a dog conference yes. sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> or a, a, a animal conference, just to not exclude anyone. Cats are welcome too. Yes. <laughs> but okay, <laughs> we, we, we'll we'll leave it at that. David, thank you very much um, for your talk and the discussion we just had and the insights into past creator.